Bonjour tout le monde. Hi everybody. Welcome to our symposium's third conversation between Nora Khan and Iris Long titled Connecting Realities, AI and VR. This discussion will be moderated by Dr. Rila Khaled. My name is Aurélie Besson. I'm General and Artistic Director at Molière from Georgiage, Montreal. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which I am speaking from is a traditional and unceded territory of the Ghanaian Gehaga, a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst nations. This conversation is part of the International Symposium Rethinking of Futures, Art and Collaboration. I invite you to consult the event's website at moliore.ca slash symposium, where you can find all the event's previous presentations and talks. After today's online conversation, the symposium will keep on growing during March with more intimate collaborative workshops, which will gather 15 international curators. From this reflexive laboratory, a publication will gradually take form within the event's website until the end of summer. We invite you to subscribe to our newsletter for more information about this publication. This event is also an occasion to celebrate Molière's anniversary. For 20 years, our organization has been co-producing digital and media art exhibitions internationally with partners in Brazil, China, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, France and Switzerland. I would like to take this opportunity to express my gratitude to all partners, curators and artists who have been collaborating with our organization all along these years and who have contributed to what Molière has become. I want to thank all speakers, our partners, and our team for all the work, especially Jade Segela and Azeman Sabet, who have been dedicated to this project. I would like to thank the Canada Council for the Arts, the Quebec government, and the Conseil des Arts de Montréal for their support. Let me introduce you the moderator of today's conversation, Dr. Hila Khaled is an associate professor of design and competition arts at Concordia University. Based on human computer interaction, design and games research, her work focuses on the use of interactive technologies to improve the human condition. Thank you, Rila, and welcome. Thank you, Aurélie, and to the audience, um, welcome. Thanks for tuning in. So our panel today, Connecting Realities, AI and VR. We'll be looking at how both of these technologies have made their presence felt in the digital arts sphere. AI and VR have both been used in various ways to explore identity and social issues. But as much as we can claim that this is a constructive and positive step towards understanding our own complexities, these same technologies have sometimes been critiqued as reinforcing questionable or problematic perspectives. In the art, science, technology sphere, projects involving these technologies have often required interdisciplinary collaboration, which means we get fresh combinations of perspectives, but transdisciplinary distance also means that we all have to work a little harder to understand each other. So I want to introduce our two speakers who both have very rich professional and personal experience with these topics. So our first speaker, Nora Khan, is a writer of criticism, a researcher and an artistic collaborator. She's worked on projects ranging from librettos, VR works, performances, scripts, and even a tiny house. She's on the faculty of Rhode Island School of Design, where she teaches critical theory, artistic research, writing for artists and designers, and technological criticism. Now, Nora's been published absolutely everywhere. So Art in America, Flash Art, Moose Four Columns, The Brooklyn Rail, Rhizome, California Sunday, Spike Art, The Village Voice, and Glass Feed. She's been commissioned to write for Serpentine Galleries, the Venice Biennale, Centre Pompidou, Swiss Institute, and Kunstverein in Hamburg. Nora received a critical writing grant in support of her writing from the Visual Arts Foundation and the Crossed Purposes Foundation in 2018. She got an IBEAM Research Residency in 2017 and a Thoma Foundation Arts Writing Award in Digital Art in 2016. 
Okay, so our second speaker will be Iris Long. And Iris is a writer and an independent curator with a background in critical writing and journalism. Iris is also a researcher on art, science, and technology at the Central Academy of Fine Arts in Beijing. Her work focuses on how art responds to the current global reality of ubiquitous computing and big data, and she teaches about data art. Iris has collaborated with Cedar Zhou since 2014, and their work has been exhibited internationally in, in diverse venues, including Cronus Art Center in Shanghai, Power Station of Art, V2 Institute for Unstable Media in Rotterdam, ICEA, and, all, and, and more places as well. And Iris has been shortlisted for the first M21 IAAC award, which is the from the International Awards for Art Criticism, and her translation work, Rethinking Curating Art After New Media, has received a nomination from Award Art of China in 2016. And this is just the edited set of recognitions for her work. So disclaimer, I'm now metaphorically peeling myself off the floor with admiration at how accomplished you both are in multiple arenas. So what a treat to have you here. So while Nora gets ready to talk, for our audience who is tuned in, don't forget that we welcome questions from you. Just type them into the chat box on screen. I'll receive them and I'll do my best to present them to our speakers during the Q&A session. Okay, so now I'm gonna hand the floor over to Nora. Nora, welcome. Thank you so much, Rilla. Um, it is really a pleasure to be here today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be in conversation with Iris, and thank you to Aurélie and to Molière, to, to Molière, to having us all here to have this conversation. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. So I wanted to just offer some notes and provocations that I hope can, um, you know, come up in the conversation today. My my own practice as a critic and as a writer for over the last ten years has been often in collaboration with artists who work with software or work with AI in some form or fashion. And so I've been a frequent collaborator and as a critic have usually found language as the primary medium through which I'm thinking about AI and artists working with AI and VR. And the kind of language that we have that we bring over from a traditional art historical kind of lineage coming up often in conflict with the language of new media, the language of AI, the language of programming. And so over the last couple of years, I've been working on a book around uh, art criticism and the, the challenges that AI and VR pose for art criticism. And so what follows are some notes on the kind of shared languages that I found in those spaces, in these mediums, as I move across fields and am in conversation with many artists who are grappling um, with the kinds of languages we use in these spaces. And so the kind of rough frame I have for today is demanding more for the critical language uh, that we have around AI and VR. And so to do that, I'll be looking at just four artists very briefly with you, hopefully two minutes for, for each artist. And through it, I offer up uh, the kinds of binaries that we often hear within uh, discussions of AI and ML and machine learning and VR. We often hear in discussions of uh, technology or the digital kind of tired binaries, for example, a very common one, the digital is less real than the embodied and offline. Um, virtual relationships is only very self-contained to the virtual sphere and relevant only to the obscure forums in which they unfold. Many uh, exhibits in the last month have shown that the activities that happen in niche virtual forums spill over into the real world uh, and kind of explode and spill over into our day-to-day. So I want to ask what kind of languages and frameworks do curators and critics and writers who are in this space need and how do the languages and metaphors that critics and curators use often determine how we engage with the artists um, who are working within these fields. As we engage with the logics of algorithmic systems, with systems of seeing, naming, and control that are difficult to discern, the intersection of art and technology often gives way to metaphors of immersion, extrication, strategic navigation, resistance, and evasion. And I'm struck by the 
methods of curatorial framing and language of what's exactly happening in our relationship with AI, um, investigating complex systems of machine learning and artificial intelligence. For example, how does one explain an algorithm to someone who has no familiarity with the term? How does one use curatorial language to make people feel agency and ownership over the phones, the devices, and the systems in which we are imbricated? Sarah Watson, in her piece, Data is the New Oil, writes about the metaphors of surfing, fathoming, drowning in the sea of data, data as oil and data so vast that we can't fathom it. I think of metaphors like that of the internet cowboy uh, or the wild west or frontier of the internet, as Wendy Chen and Don Chan both argue, give rise to a kind of pioneering neocolonial approach to the internet as a space to be conquered. Metaphors produce space, they produce orientation. Simple descriptions of AI that are very effective for people to enter the conversation, such as algorithms for machine learning being black boxed, are extremely effective in conveying a kind of priest-like ownership of information, of technical information, but also produce a sense of remove that makes humans feel like supplicants. Metaphors often reveal a pattern of narratives about our relationships to technology. So no matter how many debates are waged in this area, we still use our human intervention, we still use language to understand something like a neural network or artificial neurons seeing through pattern recognition. In the last couple of years, I've worked on a book with Casey Rias, who is an artist best known for producing processing. And what you're seeing are some stills from um, an untitled, a project called Untitled, in which Casey Rias, like Anna Riddler, like many artists working with AI, trains neural networks up from the ground up using 100,000, 200,000 images sourced from films um, like all of Bergman's uh, oeuvre, for example, or Hitchcock's oeuvre, to then train a neural network to produce images that say something about the aesthetic of the original filmmaker, the original set of films. And in working on Casey's book, Making Pictures with Generative Adversarial Networks, I was struck by how often the word dreamlike or hallucination is used to describe AI-produced imagery. Um, surreal and dreamlike is used all the time to describe the output of a generative adversarial network, the machine's dream, a kind of computational surrealism, portmanteaus that suggest an aesthetic that's related to human art history, uh, you know, pr traditions of surrealism, traditions of austrian or defamiliarization, and also suggest something in the process of pattern making and learning about our aesthetic as humans, parsing through millions of images of a film to create millions of images of film-like um, AI kind of film movies it, to, as a way to kind of frame uh, the scale of ML aesthetics. But this word dreamlike, uh, we recognize in the term deep dream, suggests a kind of computational surreal, but it also divorces our ability to have a critical reading of these images. Not because we can't critically analyze dreams, or there's a theory on dreams that we can draw on, but because the word dreams sometimes can suggest such a divorce from reality, such a deeply mutable, changeable, subjective space that a critique, which by definition formalizes or pins patterns, becomes inapplicable. So I want to actually play a short piece um, by Casey can just open up. This is one of the two films of Casey's that I'll show here, in which these images are edited together to create a kind of AI-generated film. It's important to reveal or struggle through to articulate what these images signify, to figure out why they're important, how the language we do use limits our understanding of the technological process, the mathematical process embedded, and their aesthetic uniqueness, because the language on offer is still brooded and machine dreaming. This is a first step. These images form the latent space of images for persona by Ingmar Bergman. They form an atmosphere, a cinematic kind of mood. And we might come up with other terms to think about the symbolic world that an AI generated from a Bergman film suggests. Shadow selves, aspirations for the divine, 
as a viewer, we have all the agency of interpretation and understanding a mathematical process, so we can better understand how a persona or a Bergman film is actually symbolically constructed. We move on to the next one. There's powerful ambiguity here in the psychological space that's created and the gap between the GANS images and the training images. We might start to understand the GANS process as one of refinement, of distinguishing between forgeries. And there's so many interesting linguistic questions that maybe we can dive into in the, in the discussion after this between the original set of images from Persona and these images. What's the language at hand, the critical language for seeing the field of all possible images? What's the language we have for the weird psychological space where we have an image and a machine generated image a quarter of the way, midway to like the, the actual image of a Bergman film? How do we learn these patterns and identify them? These are just some of the issues that Casey's um, artistic practice brings up. And I'm most interested in how we might think of this as seeing along a limit, um, along an asymptote. Let's see if I can close this and open this again. How might we understand as critics, as curators, our own relationship to AI and to computation as a relationship in progress? And one a relationship in which we are not uh, even fully cognizant always of what is actually going on. So the more that I dig into the language that we have that is critical around machine learning and AI art to evaluate why it's compelling, the more I'm struck as how, how often my language fails or how, how often critical language fails. In some ways, in the two films that we just showed, I feel like I could easily spend another five or ten years trying to find language for what I'm looking at. And I often find that this language is found in collectivity with other critics and other um, folks who are trying to parse, parse through the meaning of these works. So this tension between opacity and mysticism, dreamlike and surreal language around um, AI aesthetics, and on the other end, a kind of tendency towards clarity or unveiling the logics of AI, specifically predictive AI, is what I want to move to next. Trevor Paglin and Hito Steirl are known for their collaboration, specifically Machine Readable Hito in 2017, where the theorist Hito Steirl was photographed by Paglin in uh, thousands of different expressions um, in which a machine learning network was trained to understand her um, emotional expressions and then try to gauge uh, gender or where on the spectrum of gender she uh, sat based on her expression. And so it was a process of trying to show a predictive network of how a machine learning network actually learns from facial expression. And there are lots of overlaps with coded bias and facial recognition, which we might get into. But this is an instantiation of a kind of artistic practice of unveiling or revealing the logic of an algorithm. And a lot of artists now are taking up this work of unveiling the black box or revealing the logic of AI that is often distant from the public or that the, the public feels uh, shut off from or disenfranchised from. American Artist is another um, artist uh, who is working with predictive policing and in my blue window works with the logic of the predictive algorithms that predict crime. Um, first put into LAPD police cars about five years ago, and now more and more common in American cities within cop cars. American Artist was working, hopefully this is, this can be softer on, on that end, but works with, um, worked with uh, video imagery from uh, New York City police cars to see what cops are actually seeing as they work through um, and drive through a city using predictive maps in which an algorithm is giving zones in which they should target um, and actually scroll around and walk around more that day. And so Jackie Wang in Carceral Capitalism describes this as a kind of AI-driven production of reality and production of a cycle of crime in which the police are using past crime data, often flawed, racialized, and biased data, to think about where in a city they want to go. 
what I appreciate about this piece that's a little bit different from Paglin and uh, Steyl's piece is the way in which we are asked to sit in the logic of a predictive algorithm and without uh, needing highly technical language, you have an understanding of the flaws, the gaps, and the blind spots within an algorithm. And these are the ways that artistic practice is trying to bridge this enormous gap of like technical literacy from between the public and like the priests of Silicon Valley, for example. And so there are ways in this space and in between this kind of work and the reality of us living the outcomes of predictive algorithms which are sorting us based on risk and prediction of the kinds of people we are, uh, there's a space in this kind of critical language in which we can start to think of interventions and a kind of empowering language for the public, which I think artists like American artists and Paglin and Styrel are doing brilliantly. So from the range of hallucination and surrealist dreaming to the kind of tactile lived reality of the of predictive AI, artists are kind of laying out the range of possible languages we can think about and also piercing through binaries and kind of tired language that doesn't doesn't reveal more about the um, machine learning system or AI that's actually being critiqued or is on, at hand. I wanted to close with a short project um, that might bridge our conversations between uh, AI and VR in, in that, you know, VR is like an, is another interesting side of this in which we can think of as algorithms and their logics are shown and better understood through artistic practice, we can start to think of the underlying mental models within technology. And VR is one of the spaces which uh, I know Rilla and Iris have excellent critiques of VR and I know a lot of artists that I work with students in digital media have great critiques of the kinds of assumptions of empathy immersion that VR is often you know, marketed with. And so some of the more experimental uses of VR um, help people create a collaborative space in which a collaborative language around technological simulation can be defined. This is a project that I worked on with a VR puppetry team called Team Rolfus, in which we were asked to create a virtual space in the light of COVID for Unsound Music Festival based in Krakow, Poland. And so uh, the hotel forum, which is in the background, was something that was modeled in space. This character I wrote, a uh, kind of curator interviewer who would interview the musicians and artists who were at the festival. And so over the course of two weeks, as everyone started to log in as their avatar, um, you know, interviewing artists and meeting in this kind of conference setting here, a different kind of meta uh, layer on top of the festival, which is, you know, well-loved and people have many like embodied memories of was created in this space that actually took on its own life and a different kind of language and vicariance in which we were extending ourselves through our avatars to one another in this alternate space of shared memory and hopeful, hopefully futurity where we can meet together again in person was created in between. And so as a critic, as a writer, as a, as a collaborator, I'm most compelled by these moments of collaborative simulation in which a collective language, a noisy collective language can be negotiated between one and others about the ways that technology, specifically algorithms and virtual spaces affect us, affect how we see, affect how we move through, through the world and affect how we create. And so those are just some of the provocations I just wanted to offer today. And I look forward to the conversation with Rilla and Iris. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Nora, thank you so much for that. Gosh, there's so much to unpack there. Like I could, uh, yes, I could go off on so many tangents. The one that I am going to pick up for now relates to the work you described, um, Casey Rios's work with um, the Bergman film Persona, which, um, like, I, I can, I, thinking about that movie, I can, I can totally imagine how dreamy the 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 resulting uh, product must be. And, and then I started thinking, what would you get if you ran those same algorithms over keeping up with the Kardashians? Like, do you, do you end up with something equally beautiful? And, and you know, the, okay, it's a, it's a stupid example, but then the thing that that got me too is that um, a lot of what I take away from what you've said is 
about you know the symbiosis between us as makers and AI or or also VR and how you know we are as we explore these technologies more as we learn about them more we we're working out how to be partners with these like I, I would call it mutual symbiosis um, maybe it's actually like a mutually parasitic relationship because we, we we get a lot out of these two they get a lot of out of our human culture um, so okay there's there's a little bit to, to mull over there at this point let's move over to iris and i want to remind our audience that um, we're accepting questions from you so just type them into the comment box below Okay, um, thank you, Rila, for the kind um, introduction, and thank you, Moliere, for the kind invitation. And I'm actually like indulged with Nora's talk, so like, const like, like taking a lot of notes. So I have to kind of revert to a presenter mode for a minute. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, so uh, just like Nora, I work as a curator, and also um, I work as a um, sort of uh, using creative coding in my own um, artistic practices as well. So today I'm just going to be talking a little bit about my own experience of working or curating with AI, or also like um, actually employing a machine learning tool in my own curatorial practices. So next slide. Yeah, and this is just like a few um, images of the curatorial work that I have done before. Um, a lot of artists working with AI are featured, for example, Anna Riddler, um, Jean Cogan, Mima Atkin, and Kate Crawford, and uh, they basically, yeah, many of them. And next slide. So uh, I want to start with a quote from the 1960s, which is uh, from Mark Weiser, who is a computer scientist and um, sort of a technology officer at Zero and uh, Xerox Park, who said um, who said that the most profound technology is are those that disappear. Here, like they weave themselves into the fabric of everyday life until they are indistinguishable from it. I think it's. I mean, I still find a lot of resonance of this quote even today. Like we can kind of apply the similar um, sort of um, uh, how do you say like the similar sort of uh, way of thinking, not just to um, AI but also VR and all kinds of computational technologies that we don't necessarily feel existing somehow, and. I think like although AI is still considered or like promoted as sort of this frontier by uh, many companies and like tech industries and actually a large part of it has already disappeared like or at least not referred to as AI anymore. Like this is a common understanding from the computational um, industry. Like people often say like when something is achieved, it's not understood as AI anymore. Like for example, for text translation or voice recognition and to certain um, extent soft driving, sometimes we don't necessarily like allocate them as sort of the most advanced AI technology anymore, just like part of our lives. And I'm just curious, like how this kind of disappearance of technology happened. And I think to a certain way, like the disappearance of uh, AI is happening in two kinds of layers. And the first one is ironic, ironically, AI or machine learning is often referred to the unrealized, the unsolved, or even the unsure parts of this particular kind of tech. And then the achieved functions are kind of fade from our, um, the fade into the background or actually fade from the capital's attention, from the industry's attention. And secondly, I think that machine learning is also using this um, term from uh, coding uh, language is encapsulated. So like, I'm not just talking about the black box of AI, but also like um, in general, the entire area of machine learning is encapsulated so that we can access to it easily, but without the necessity to um, to know the details or whatever is happening background. Because like in, in computer science, the the process of encapsulation is for easier access to methods. Like you can just call the method without the necessity to know how exactly this method is written. 
but this also means that this high level of encapsulation in the same time providing more accessibility is also hiding a lot of things behind this interface, behind this super accessible interface. And then, <clears throat> next slide. And um, Nora um, talk about metaphors, and I'm actually starting with the metaphor. So like I'm using Ripple as a metaphor of like how the knowledge of AI gets distributed. So like we know that often just just like all kinds of technology, it goes just kind of from this R and D stage, and then to a wider application, and then it gets popularized, and then this is the moment when it enters the narrative of TV series and popular culture and novels, and then. Why I think Ripple might be an interesting metaphor for this um, distribution of AI is because I think there's there's this, this normal perception of a tendency of perception of thinking AI as a unified, a big integrated existence, which is not necessarily true because we're talking about when we talk about machine learning, we're actually talking about multiple enterprises, multiple regions and multiple like sort of this geographical or, um, you know, like um, uh, technological uh, borders that are actually having a lot of conflicts and power structures or computing power structures and dynamics. So it's actually multiple um, ripples instead of one big hierarchical thing. And then next slide. <clears throat> and when it comes to the um, intersection of AI and art, and also like how art is represented, AI, quote unquote AI art is represented um, in the public attention, I noticed that there are three different kinds of categories. And um, so like in what commonly understood as the presentation sites, the white cubes for art, there are three um, different kind of um, I think perspectives regarding um, curating AI and art. So like, I'm just giving a, a few examples of exhibitions that took place in the past three or four years. And um, so one of them, for example, the AI more, more than human, the big, big exhibition of Barbican. I think this kind of shows is actually dealing a lot with um, just as science communication, we have this kind of AI communication. So basically telling very generally, broadly, or sometimes chronologically what AI is about, making it comprehensive, but also super accessible. And for, um, there's another kind of exhibition, for example, the Entangled Realities or the Open Codes, I think deal with more on this kind of critical engagement or based on a certain kind of understanding of the language of machine learning, then these people are raising speculations of what this technology may mean to us in the future. So like it's not um, entirely doing a job of communicating, like um, how do you say, like uh, communicating about what AI is, but, but more of raising speculations. And then a third type is actually what, I'm, what I found super interesting. So. A lot of like traditional contemporary art museums are starting to doing this sort of what I would call historicizing or like allocating AI art in the canon or the traditional you know existing canon of contemporary art, often curating or combining the practices of AI art together with the painting or sculpture or um, their existing collections. And then I think this is a very um, obvious tendency, but I'm not sure whether it's a good or bad thing for practices um, directly with technologies, but there is this tendency of the sort of conventional art world trying to invite or incorporate or or historicizing this um, AI art practices. And another area that I found super interesting is actually a lot of AI art works are actually presented in conferences, in computer science conferences, as opposed to museums or institutions. And the audience of these conferences, like from ranging from SIGGRAPH to IEEE or to NFPS, which is a natural language processing um, conference, actually overlap very little with the art audiences. But these kind of practices do exist and they actually um, like work closely or um, are presented um, together with um, the sort of research from the computational science field. And I think that's actually an interesting part to um, keep attention to when it comes to AI and art. Uh, next. <clears throat> And when it comes to the um, curatorial um, approach or artistic approach, I think there are three points that I think are necessary to think about when uh, dealing with 
not just AI, but all kinds of technologies, all kinds of technologies that are, are unfamiliar to, um, to the general public. So the first one is, uh, Nora already mentioned, is about techno literacy. So when I say techno literacy, I mean an understanding of medium or technology not just on its conceptual level, but also on the technical level. I think the technical level is sometimes more difficult to, to tackle. And the second is the urgency. So like, you know, like the criticality of technology, like how we bring up this potential risks, biases, or ideologies, or all kinds of ignored or hidden situations of this particular kind of tech. And then a third one is empathy, which is also often criticized as a marketing tool of tech companies. But actually, it could also be used as a creative tool for curators or artists, like how you generate a, or design this narrative or experience on site in all the experiences for the for their um, exhibition to make it less cold in a sense. And then next, this is a video. Oh, okay. Maybe the video is not playing. And maybe uh, lastly, I will just give one example of my own curatorial practices uh, of trying to actually work uh, with a machine learning tool um, uh, in an exhibition. So um, this was to show that actually I did like a year and a half ago and it toured to Shanghai at the end of last year. So it's titled um, Lying Sophia and Mocking Alexa, which is taking, again, taking two metaphors from the AI industry. So like two famous recognized AI figures, one embodied and one not embodied, and two female names. And then Sophia is the Hanson Robotic, um, you know, the <clears throat> the sort of humanoid, um, widely distributed and also often criticized as a fake AI because uh, she appears more um, talent and all encompassing than what actually what she actually is. And then Alexa is the you know the the Amazon's um, audio device and um, famous also famous for this viral video on to, on YouTube that is uh, is kind of laughing on its own, which is not. Um, um, which is not like real love, but actually it kind of satisfies a lot of people's sort of dark fantasies or um, sort of this conspiracy, conspiracy imagination of a dystopian AI might do, and it's not embodied. So it's actually creating more kind of mysterious feelings. So I'm actually taking the two figures as two metaphors of a common attitude towards AI. So like more the utopia version and the dystopia version, the optimistic one and the sort of um, um, critical one. And then next slide. Oh, so ne ne again, next slide. Yeah. And then this is just like uh, for the exhibition, I also um, kind of just drew the lifeline or the storyline of the two figures in real world. So like when they were turned on, when they were get to the market and then all the stories that happened to Sophia and Alexa in the real life. And then next slide. And what actually happened in the exhibition is that uh, I co-developed two chatbots uh, with um, GPT-2, we're using this famous um, natural language processing um, algorithm called GPT-2. So we actually um, trained two chatbots, one named Sophia and one named Alexa, and they were talking about exhibition um, throughout the entire duration of the show. And then this conversation is actually conducted on three different kind of layers. So the first one is the two were talking about the sort of the overall exhibition um, subject. And this conversation is broadcasted using this um, central broadcasting system of the show. And it's very occasional, so like you will only be hearing one or two pairs of sentences like per hour. And then the two will also be chatting like very noisily, chatting about the um, the theme of each exhibition section and then using the direction audio. So like you will only be hearing this part of the conversation at certain points, physical points of the show, and they will be discussing, sometimes debating on the theme of each section. And the third layer is like, um, if you scan a QR code on the on the show, and then instead of, um, you know, like looking the captions of each in individual artwork, you will be actually hearing the two chatbots through your headphone and talking and discussing about each individual artwork. So they're actually um, conducting the conversation on three different layers via through different kind of audio devices and um, with different kind of time temporal frequencies. And also, um, and also 
since it's like generated in real time, so you will not be hearing the same conversation um, anymore. So this this just like kind of my experiment to not just using metaphors, but also converting metaphors as um, as sort of audio experience as and also using directly with an algorithm to create this narrative for a particular exhibition about AI. And next slide. And also, so we go back to the ripples. And then I think another interesting thing about uh, the practices of AI and art is actually it can take um, a pretty wide of spectrum of practice. So it, it also kind of uh, echo with that um, ripple format, like you know, like from frontier to the popularization, and then it's happening on a regional basis. So I guess, like say, like people, an artist have been working or using AI not just as tools, but also they are investigating like data sets and they are challenging existing models. And there are also artists who aren't necessarily trained um, with coding, but they are able to create this kind of anthropomorphic. Uh, version or their own imagination of AI. And that, I actually think that part of practices are also acceptable and also is part of the discussion of AI art. So we're not just talking about artists who are capable of code, but also who are capable of raising all kinds of possible scenarios of this particular kind of tech with their own familiar languages. And then also there, are, of course, there are people who are talking about this kind of technopolitics or like the geographies of AI in general, ranging from um, so like uh, also like based from what um, what kind of like countries or what kind of uh, you know like the tech background they're operating on. So I think the diversity of AI and art is also creating this kind of ripple effect. So it's happening simultaneously in many many places with all kinds of centers, and then it's also interconnected and interwoven and doing it all together. So the last slide, and um, it's just like my short. Um, metaphorical conclusion and then yes yeah, so I think like reports are in a way like they're not hierarchical or like not not like a top-down structure but they are waveforms and they're transmitting and they're interwoven so I think maybe an interesting intervention uh, either from a curatorial perspective or an artistic perspective an interesting um, intervention with AI is like how we can kind of swing within this existing repos and also connecting them and more importantly how we can create more among them the last of my slide. Look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Iris. I absolutely love that. I especially love this last line you have about swimming with the ripples. So while you were talking, I, I couldn't help but um, think of my own experience of working, I, I guess the closest sphere in which I've come to working with AI and art concerns the work I've done with AI and games. And um, I have an HCI background. I, I, work, I worked with like sort of computer science AI types. And, and I could never understand why they picked the research questions that they did. Like it, it was always perplexing. It was like, well, why do you want to train this game to play itself? Like what, what? What is the, what's the merit there? Like there was all of this effort put into procedural content generation for, for very like particular and like uninteresting types of, of games. Um, all right, so I want to sort of, yeah, thinking with that idea of swimming with the ripples, like I, I really like this idea of approaching this issue laterally and maybe, maybe I'll, kick us off thinking about these issues collectively by thinking about data sets and bias <laughs> in ML. Okay, because uh, both of you talked about sort of, um, you talked, of, well, you, you touched briefly on da data sets in various ways. So critiques of machine learning are that, well, one of them is that Algorithmic bias occurs when it is trained on data sets that are not sufficiently diverse. So, you know, swimming with the ripples, how are artists engaging with or critiquing algorithmic bias? 
Mm, I think there are already quite a few examples of um, artists challenging directly data sets. And <clears throat> I guess one of the famous one is the collaboration between um, Kate Crawford and Trevor Paglum, that image roulette um, project. So which is um, diving directly into ImageNet, which is like the biggest, biggest data set, official and, you know, the data set for a lot of um, computer vision um, softwares. And then they just kind of did this research uh, diving into this um, image that data set and trying to find out, um, you know, this kind of miscategorized parts or ambiguous um, terms that, you know, all these workers were labeling, like how they were labeling the images and this consensus part within data sets. So I think actually a lot of them are doing um, works on this. Another um, example I just think about is um, this um, New York based artist Philip Schmidt who did a project um, on trying to find the connection of, you know, like we are fed with the result of image recognition, like the algorithm is telling me, and this isn't a film, but how how do they know this is a film? So he did this amazing project. He was juxtapos juxtaposing that result of the um, um, image recognition with the training data set like so you will see not just the result of this is a film but also all kinds of images that is telling the algorithm or were labeled as film in the data set so he literally just put them together to create this context or kind of um, bridging you know between the results and the, the, the back ends. I think that are the two examples that I can think about yeah it's a, it's a really great question to start off with and I just wanted to say Iris I <laughs> I took just as many notes when you were speaking. It was just incredible the short talk that you gave. And something that you touched on, Iris, and maybe this can um, it just in terms of like the ecology of discourse that I think artists are actually really central in is that you have academics, you have machine learning engineers, you have computer scientists, you have theorists, and mm -hmm. um, you have activists. And there are many overlaps between all of those those circles, those ripples, they, that ripple, like you've discourse and artistic practice that ripples out to theory, that ripples out to academia, not in that it's so like, you know, black and white or hard and fast. Something that I do think that artists like Paglin, like Crawford, um, like American artists have been really at the forefront of is because we have the historical visual language within this like dominant visual regime of algorithmically produced images, you have artists often who are starting to sort patterns and trying to track like how does bias like manifest in the data sets or AI that we have today. And so I find it's like it's it's a back and forth conversation in which it's mm -hmm. becomes less of a cultural split between artistic critique or like activist critique and and engineering the sciences and instead um, a conversation between. So in that piece that I showed by American artists, um, American artists had looked at a book of theory, Carceral Capitalism, which was about um, predictive policing in uh, as it was being introduced in the US and that came out through my T press I think like in 2016 and then they made this work in which this work traveled museums around the country and people start to see that this was start to investigate or have conversations around how is this being enacted in policing in my city and that then became like a larger conversation that you know showed up in an AI conference later. And so I see this as like a larger economy in which our ecology in which it's not adversarial, but instead artists are seeing, um, identifying blind spots and then creating these spaces for discourse for the public to come in, um, activate and demand, you know, better data sets or not that there can, that's a whole other debate is can you have like a perfect unbiased data set is there such a thing as lack of bias or is the more important no but is of course but is there or is the more important thing to like have awareness always that there is a position that there are choices that the map is not an objective or neutral thing the data set is not an objective or neutral thing and constantly disrupting or dismantling that illusion of neutrality and uh think about how is that neutrality constructed and i think that comes to this point of disappearance that Iris, you were bringing up is like, how how does the political element of a data set of how it's constructed get disappeared mm -hmm. or how do we forget it or how is it designed away and out of sight? And so I think artists are just kind of, you know, the critics, the the one, the lone voice in the room who is like, should this thing be made? Why was it made? And asking that question repeatedly. 
So this actually connects quite well to a question that comes from the audience. So do you think that the language associated to AI or more broadly techno literacy can widen generational gaps within the curatorial field? Hmm. Do you think you could, do you, do you mean widen the gaps or widen and close? Or maybe you could, how do you interpret the question? So the, the way that I would interpret this question, I think is maybe, is, is techno literacy, is it the case that, you know, some of the, some of the, the curatorial body will decide this is worthwhile us investing our time into learning. Whereas, you know, perhaps an older generation will say, no, this is too much for me. Like, is it, like the current language that we have, perhaps it does that, but with the, the language and the metaphors that you've been proposing, do we still have that issue or are we talking about, could this be how we close the gaps? <sighs> Well, I, I would say from my end, one of the big curatorial functions within like an art and technology space is to form a language that you can have this intergenerational, intergenerational conversation um, around. So I remember doing a project on Pradpol um, with Lynn Hirschman Leeson, and um, it was a show of mostly of mostly artists who were working with AI in some way. And this uh, lovely, Australian couple came up to me and I think they were in their like maybe late 60s, early 70s in the middle of this show and were like, and asked, you know, is any of this art? I, can you actually explain to me how this is art or how these works are? They didn't, and so it actually was a really big moment of like, well, there needs to be a glossary here. There needs to be terms that actually make, you know, the moment you pick up this phone or, you know, you log on, all of these issues that are bubbling in this space are, embodied and and you know you are enacting them the minute you move leave the exhibition or you leave the space so to produce language that is accessible but that doesn't lose the rigor of of what is actually being described is i i really feel like an art critic and curator's job right now is to is to bridge both of those worlds and so to for many people to come in i hope and also, like, I'm also interested, say, like, when we say generation, we are referring to how many years? Because, like, sometimes I think, you know, like, paradigm shifts take longer than we normally think. It's not like 10 years, 20 years. It could be like hundreds of years. And then, say, just one example, I think to some extent, we still live in the shadow of the cybernetics. Like we still live in what's, you know, like this kind of leftover of the war times and this kind of, you know, all this military background of contemporary computer -like technology. And it, we're still living in part of it. So I think, and it's, it's also kind of in our sort of subconscious, subconsciousness. And then, and actually like when I read, you know, like what the, the curators or the artists wrote in the 1950s, 60s, I still find them useful. So I think that, you know, like I'm not thinking about like breaking generations into five or 10 years, but also thinking of something that can, some experiences or languages that actually can last longer, that may be useful for people, you know, like in, in, in 50 years from now. So like they may not be dealing with AI anymore. They may be dealing with something entirely like we can never imagine, but some issues remain the same, I think. I think Iris, you also brought up this question of, historicizing and how curators historicize the discourse of AI. And I've always found it's much more useful to talk about technologies as, as super old and AI is mm -hmm. a very old thing. And there have been automata and like the attempt to make mechanical automata for like thousands of years. And, you know, a pen was a piece of technology, paint is a kind of technology. Um, mm -hmm. So when you can start to like connect these impulses that are embedded within the mirror of AI or systems as something that's always been around, we've always been looking for other ways to like outsource our seeing or our labor. Um, and this is that AI and, and VR and all these technologies are expressions of that, those same impulses So starting to draw those lines and through lines has been very helpful in, in crossing generational gaps. 
Yeah, uh, reflecting on both of your answers, I think um, disappearance absolutely comes up here as, as a relevant quality to, to think about, like the, the fact that we don't think about uh, a pen as technology mm -hmm. anymore, that, that is disappearance because it's so integrated and that it's really, it's interesting to think about what needs to happen for AI VR to, to reach that level. So I have another question from the audience. How can this new landscape of AI, VR, and even AR inspire how we might organize and govern arts organizations? Okay, I'm, I'm gonna, maybe I'll think about how we could break that down. How have these technologies worked to, to, I, to I guess, create <clears throat> divisions, hierarchies, groupings, and interdisciplinary contexts that you've worked in? Mm. Iris, do you want to go first? I just want to make sure I'm not speaking first. <laughs> uh, um, I think one obvious thing is that um, this kind of, uh, how do you say, like knowledges or techno knowledges are not something that you can just like generate within a particular institution like is you are talking about um, having an intersection or actually gathering information and exchanges with a very very big industry and something really is larger than art so in a way so I guess that's the obvious thing like um, institu institutions are um, for example, like the Serpentine um, galleries have been running this sort of, uh, um, you know, like creative AI lab and all this kind of like uh, for R&D, they raised the term R&D, but within an art institution. So like how there is this R&D position uh, in art that can be the hub for all kinds of, uh, you know, like um, uh, interaction with um, the current, you know, what's going on in the tech field. So I guess that's the most obvious connection I can think about. So like you can't educate yourself in this case. <laughs> what I've really found over the last year to sort of mirror what Iris is describing and it's just the ways that institutions <laughs> take on the challenge of being, you know, both like digitally fluid, but also how they decide to frame AI or AR, which actually is like one of my favorite things to talk about, but maybe another another time. But how the Creative AI Lab at the Serpentine is a perfect example. Like they are drawing on the history of research and development labs of EAT, of Bell Labs, and Robert mm -hmm. Rauschenberg, you know, wandering the halls of AT and T. And so there is a model of like the artist as consultant or the artist as um, you know, the wild card who comes in and out of a of both a tuck space and also then like comes back to the art world and goes is this um, rogue element <laughs> who wanders between industries. And so it's it is interesting to think of or what I think is going to be very important is for museums, institutions and galleries to um, position themselves within this conversation, but also be very aware of, you know, how the um, temptation of collaboration mm -hmm. or the temptation of alliance with large massive big five companies can totally mm -hmm. reshape the language of like how AI is historicized like that critical distance becomes very obviously very difficult when there is a um, you know there's a funder <laughs> underneath yeah. who has is not interested in you know having having that kind of critique you know be too yeah. noisy on on the other side, like critique can be absorbed and, um, you know, art can also be the space where critique of technology that artists are expected to do that work of like unveiling and revealing. So how much fusion do you actually have of that coming back to the spaces that are being critiqued? So I think institutions are really the place where mm. that um, dialogue is either happening or it is more isolated. And so I think mm. it's going to be very important in years to come. <clears throat> Right, I've got another question um, from the audience. 
and this is this is for both of you. So more and more artists who work with AI contribute to revealing different forms of bias, as you both talked about. But how specifically can curators take part in that social and political stance? It's hmm. a very good question. I think in the last few years, we've been seeing a lot of AI shows, a lot of shows about critique of AI, critique of bias, critique of underlying systems um, and like the logic of algorithms. I would say from my experience curatorially, like the, like being a person who can, again, form that language between the institution and the public, between the artists and um, you know, the install team and the public coming in to form spaces where that critique is active. And that debate also can flourish within the institutional space and like be turned back on the institution can can include it as well mm. is um, I think of the curator or a curator today as someone who is a teacher and is creating like pedagogical space or like experimental teaching spaces where these kinds of moments of like access or lack of agency can actually be fostered so I've been thinking more of the museum or museums that foster those kinds of teaching spaces especially within um, these pressing ethical issues around AI and machine learning mm -hmm. uh, as vital, and we need more of them. Mm. Um, I think the sheer choices that a curator make, like how, what kind of pieces you choose and how you put them together, even in a traditional curatorial way, is already a manifestation of the curator's like, approach um, to these issues. Um, I just want to give one example that I tried previously. Um, so I did a show called Mind the Gap. So that, you know, like in London, you often hear the sound in a tube station, like Mind the Gap, because, you know, like the, <clears throat> the, the, the racks are too old. And sometimes like there, there's this huge gap between the, tra the track and the train. So you have to kind of step onto it. And then I think that's kind of interesting, um, a sort of a metaphor again for the, for the, you know, like our presumptions, the track, like our presumptions or our plans for the development, development of the technology and technology itself. So it may not be in perfect alignments. And then sometimes there is, there is this gap. And then uh, sorry, and the, the show I did was called Mind the Deep, so like in reverse, the uh, deep mind, so Mind the Deep. And then that was um, an exhibition in which I tried to, um, so I actually visited a lot of like um, computer conferences, and there was this tech demo section often, so like companies or like startups uh, or, um, you know, like uh, labs are demonstrating their technologies in that, you know, demo section. And then I juxtaposed some tech demos with artworks that actually use very similar types of models and you know like putting them together to create a sort of hopefully in a scenario where people can realize that these two are actually the same thing like technologically like you know but actually they're manifesting the story are told in a totally different way and then present presenting in a different way so i think maybe this very kind of violent exposition of you know um, artifacts from um, the tech field and the art field and putting them together can already kind of hopefully um, be a way to create the context i would also add you do iris you brought up um gpt2 and mm. you know experimental projects like i i always feel as a curator i'm like torn between my love of technology and like my delight and like the experimental side for example how gpt2 <coughs> or gpt3 you know generates like experimental strange poetry and language that like challenges us creatively to become you know, more more experimental and creative and, and like find new strange ways of of language mm. and form so I, I often feel like that there's a tension to balance between framing and presenting without being techno positivist or overly techno optimistic mm -hmm. um, to present like these experimental histories of, you know, GPT-2 can be thought of within the history of like John Cage and Ulipo and Alison yep. Knowles and <laughs> experimental poets. And then you also can have the hardcore critical side of artists also help us see these insidious um, hidden disappeared ways that algorithms mm -hmm. like infiltrate our day to day and 
I, I really, my dream is for everyone to be a tech critic. That's my like secret curatorial aim is like for everyone to come into an exhibition and leave feeling some agency and ownership and critique over like their mm -hmm. phone the next time they open it. Um, and I think that's what curators like really great curation can do. But also to leave with joy and not like total dread. Yeah. Like, oh my God, it's all <laughs> terrible. It's not all terrible. <laughs> You're still good. And I think I just have to like acknowledge that, you know, sometimes these tours are exciting for me. Like, I want to play with it. Like, I can't just say, you know, like, I'm just going to stand away and say, okay, this is not, you know, I, I have to be part of it to, to critique or to raise my points. Mm. All right. Um, so I think we're we're actually nearing the the end of our time now. So thank you both so much um, for participating in this absolutely fantastic conversation. Um, so I I want to thank you both, Nora and Iris. You've been absolutely brilliant. And it's been my great pleasure to have this conversation with you both. Thanks also to you, our audience, for tuning in and giving us a, a reason to explore all of this. And finally, I want to thank Molior on behalf of all of us for making this happen and for dedicating space to these types of conversations. So this talk has been recorded and will be available on the Molior Symposium website until March the 31st. Previous presentations and conversations that have taken place as part of the symposium are also already there. So the address is molior.ca slash symposium. All right, well, everyone, um, thank you and goodbye. <laughs>